Michael Boyles, strengthcoach.com presents the Strength Coach Podcast, brought to you by Perform Better, the experts in functional training and rehabilitation, performbetter.com. Hey everybody, welcome to episode 196 of the Strength Coach Podcast, the official podcast of Michael Boyles, strengthcoach.com, the world's best source for strength and conditioning information. You can try strengthcoach.com out for three days for just a buck. You'll have access to all the articles, videos, and programs, as well as the best forum on the net. It's the only place to have full access to Coach Boyle. He's on every day. Check it out at strengthcoach.com. All right, I'm your host, Anthony Renna, and the show notes for the show are located at strengthcoachpodcast.com. If you want to get in touch with me, shoot me an email to strengthcoachpodcast at gmail.com. All right, on the Coach's Corner, I spoke to Coach Boyle about some takeaways from the leadership conference he attended in London, some hamstring injuries, and a forum thread called Athlete Engagement and Behavior. That and so much more coming up on the Coach's Corner in a little while. Aaron McGurr from Perform Better joins me to talk about the holiday sale, as well as another addition to the PB Extreme line, the Glute Ham. It's brand new to the catalog. For the Results Fitness University Business of Fitness segment, Alan Cosgrove is on to talk about a concept called the Executive Athlete. For the Hit the Gym with a Shrink Coach segment, I have on Coach Justin Cavanaugh from the Sport and Speed Institute. Coach Cavanaugh joins me to discuss his philosophy on speed training, how strong we need to be, mistakes in speed training, his article, The Heavy Hip Thrust is Ruining Our Backs and the Industry, his three biggest takeaways from his meeting with Gary V. So much more coming up with Coach Cavanaugh in a little while. Lots of things to get to, so let's get on the phone with Coach Boyle. All right, now it's time for the Coach's Corner with Coach Boyle. Coach, how you doing? I'm doing great, Ann. How are you? I'm doing awesome. Uh, you just got back from London, and I wanted to talk to you about some of the takeaways there. You were telling me about... One lecture was um, the woman who runs, well, you say, well, I don't know what her name is, but uh, like something with, to do with like the culture, uh, the culture goddess over there. Chief, <laughs> I believe chief culture officer was her name. Nice. Was her actual title. And she was very funny. She actually said, yes, we have one of those. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say. What was that? What, what was that like? Uh, it was actually pretty interesting to sort of see. They, they talked a lot about kind of how they, how they hire at Google and what they're looking for. And, and this, uh, they have a very, um, she said, it's kind of like a real life version of the movie, the internship, <laughs> which I had not seen. I've seen the intern with, uh, De Niro. was it uh, De Niro was yeah. in one, but I didn't see the internship, but she, it's, you know, so they have a very kind of millennial irreverent kind of culture. You know, they have, massages and they have, you know, a cafeteria where all the food is free. And you, you know what I mean? And they actually, you know, she said something about, she said, well, it's kind of like the internship, except we don't have a Quidditch league. And then someone told her that actually they do have a Quidditch team in the San Francisco office. Oh. So, you know what I mean? It's just that kind of, I think it's that ability. And this is what you, what you see. I think that's to me was the brilliance of it is that are these people who are learning to understand the people that are in fact their employees. Do you know what I mean? Like, they, okay, this is our demographic. This is what they think is important. And they also talked about transparency and access and how uh, the, you know, the CEOs and the founder are around and are, you know, like are at a meeting once a week where people can ask them questions. And it's not this very sort of hierarchical, you know, you never get to talk to the boss kind of thing. You know, it's like, I can't imagine that, you know, at GE, Jack Walsh having a weekly meeting with the staff and taking questions from some guy who just got hired out of Yale. And, and I think that's what they're really trying to do. And then she said, obviously too, she said, you know, the engineers are different birds and, and but there are rock stars. So, you know, we've yeah. got to figure out a way to kind of communicate with our engineers and to let them have their ability to, uh, to do their thing. And, they also talked about they, they have this idea of 20% time, which basically means that you can devote 20% of your time to something that you think would be a great project for the company. 
and they'll let you do it. So, you know, they said Gmail came from that and some other things where somebody said, I have a really good idea. And they're saying, okay, we'll let you, you know, eight hours a week, you can work on your little project and we're going to pay for it. So it's a, it's a very empowering culture. And I do think for me looking at, you know, at Mike Boyle strength and condition, like you always talk kind of about this super trainer thing, but I do have a group of really talented young people that are there and in much the same way, whether it's, you know, Kevin and Marco going to Dubai to do the CFSC or a lot of these things, if I don't really cater to their interests, which is teaching and educating and getting better and just said, oh, I just need you on the floor. You, know, you guys just got to be here and grind it out, coach, you know, coach groups, train people, make me more money. Those people aren't going to stay around. But if I can create an environment for them where they say, hey, you know, I want, I'm taking off three days to go to Andrea Spina's class, we give them a $500 annual stipend to help pay for that. And we give them the time off to go do that. And if they say, hey, can we have so-and-so, you know, is going to be around, can they come in and talk? Yeah, absolutely. You know, we're having Anna Hartman next week again on Thursday because she was a really big hit with the staff and I invited yeah. her to come back. So I think it is, I think you can take lessons as much as I don't want to compare Mike Boyle's strength and conditioning to Google. I think there's a lot of parallels in trying to have something that you think of as best in class and then trying to keep those people around and not have sort of the, the brain drain where these guys are constantly looking to leave because, yeah. and this goes back, we've talked about first break all the rules that, that book. And one of the things that, I, that I've always talked about, I wrote an article on the site on first break all the rules for coaches, but in first break all the rules, one of the things they say very clearly is that money is not what keeps people out of job. And it's actually very, very low on the list. And there's a lot more things that create satisfaction for people at work than simply how much money they make. Yeah. Uh, you know, Mike, there's another, I, for me, I, I kind of feel like a lot of that stuff too is not, you can't be, you know, if you can't beat them, join them. But, you know, I think with what Google does, they realize that a lot of people understand that they could be doing a lot of this stuff from home with the technology now. Um, so I think making these environments where you kind of want to go to work as well, and, and it's and it you can do some of those the similar things where they know people are gonna kind of still go out and do some stuff on their own. It's almost like well let's let's encourage it. We know they're gonna do it anyway. Let's be part of it. And I think it's a little. I think there's a similar, uh, you know, feeling that that you know or, you know at MBSC in terms of look. We all know the trainer. I guess the evolution of a trainer, not from the perspective of the way you wrote it with, you know, being a bodybuilder and power lifter, getting injured and then working on corrective. But, but like there's an evolution of a trainer where you're so excited about being a trainer, you become a trainer, you start doing really well. And then you start realizing that the money isn't probably, you know, even, even though we're not doing it for the money all the time, it might not be very sustainable to live the life that you want to live after a while. And then you have to go elsewhere. So I think you've, what you've done is basically done the same thing. You've partnered with some of your best people on your certification, on your online stuff, on, you know, allowing them to come in and, and have space. So I think in that respect, it's very similar. Like, I know they're going to do it anyway. Why don't I have them do it here and do it with them? No, exactly. I know they're going to do it anyway. And I know they're, they're probably going to go and take these great. And it's that idea of even the CFSC idea. That was sort of a joint hatchling where we sat down and said, okay, wait a second, if we're going to do this, what are we going to do? How are we going to do it? And, and my big thing was it has to have a practical component. We can't not do that. But you know, then I, you know, I said to those guys, you know, Hey, you guys take the ball and run with it, you know, and, and they've done, I mean, you know, they far exceeded whatever expectation I might've had for this thing in the first two years, they've gone, yeah. And we just did one for the San Diego Padres. I mean, I can't even believe that if you think about it, a professional sports team brought in, not Mike Boyle, but the Mike Boyle strength and conditioning staff to do this certification for their minor league strength and conditioning coaches. That's a massive step forward for our guys, you know, even going to Dubai and, and the, the people in Dubai being thrilled with the job that they're doing. The, the emails that I get about the work that these guys and girls, because Christina has yeah. been doing it too, do is pretty amazing. So yeah, I think there is, 
And I think that's the key. And that's what was cool when you go back to this idea about this leaders in sport conference that I was at in London is that you've got to be able to draw the parallels from other successful operations. So they had people there from the Royal Ballet. They had people there from a design school in London that's been very successful at like design the Dyson vacuum. And, and what these guys at leaders are trying to do, which I think is really cool, is bring in the best in class in a lot of different areas, not just sport. And obviously there were a lot of sports people there, but at the same time they're, they're saying, Hey, there can be some really good lessons for us in sport or in like for me, Hey, my business is fitness now. Man. Do you know what I mean? It's not really sport. When you look at it, sure. we've, we've, we've tipped to the point where we are now more than 50% fitness. And I, even just being able to deal with that. Okay. How do we deal with this adult fitness market, which has now become such a massive part of our business? And how do we then take that and package it like with thrive to, to sell it to other people so that they can use it. And then how do we teach people how to do it? And we figured out, you know, with the CFSC, okay, this is, this is the best way we can think of to, to teach people to do it. And then, you know, Kevin's figured out the sort of online education stuff and, and even, you know, Ken Whittier and Steve Bigelow are doing online training programs, which they've had some success with. I think they, you know, they made some money last month with, you know, going through with exercise.com and developing online programs so that you can now, I mean, you can get our staff meeting online. You can buy our programs online. You can get certified. It's like we're becoming a full service business in addition to a really good place to train. And we're doing that with a bunch of really engaged people who are not, they're no longer just employees. And I think yeah. that probably is the biggest distinction is that you, you talk, because I think we always kind of go through this idea of cliches and you talk about in the cliche, Oh, I feel a sense of ownership for this. Mm -hmm. Well, in, in our situation, they don't feel a sense of ownership. They have a piece of ownership of yeah. some of these little ventures. They don't own any of Mike Boyle strength and conditioning, but they do own parts of these little ancillary things that we've spun off where they're directly compensated based on the revenue that comes in and that they will be for as long as they, you know, and I don't, some of these things, I don't even know how the contracts read that. I don't know if it's, <laughs> I think, I think in some of it, I think they have to stay with us for five years, but then even in five years, like if let's just say Ken owns 10% of this online business that we're doing, I think if he stays with us for five years and then leaves, he maintains his 10% mm -hmm. because there is kind of a, I, I, a, I guess a vesting sort of process yeah. Yeah. that goes through this. And even like with Brendan, when Brendan had to move to the West coast, Brendan had 10% of the CFSC and he kept it and, and he's been great. He's been very good about doing all of our West coast events and servicing our West coast clients while he now works out of a gym in uh, California in San Francisco. Yeah. It's very cool. So, we're figuring out ways and it's, it, it sounds very cliche, but when everybody succeeds, Mike Boyle succeeds. There you go. Yeah. So ultimately when you, and this is, I think you and I've talked a lot about this, I think over time, but it's this sort of karmic approach to the whole thing now of realizing that not wanting a hundred percent of everything for yourself, not being in kind of greed mode where, it's all about how much money can I make probably results in me actually making more money. I probably make more money than I've ever made yet. I'm giving away more ownership than I've ever given. Yeah. Yeah. And so that's cool. Well, I can tell you that I will probably sue for 1% of the CFSC because it all started when we did, when I started strength and conditioning webinars, and then I tried to get CEUs from the NSCA, and they denied them, and then you came up with the idea of saying, you know what? I'm going to start my own certification, me, you, and Dewey on your kitchen table. So there you go. That's I own, right. I'm that was suing. the birth of the American yeah, right. Strength and Conditioning Association. That's right. The See, I, I will sue for I registered. 1%. I registered that domain name that night. I think That's, I still have it. I'm not sure if I let it go or not. But. That's very cool. Coach, um, let's, we'll move on. Uh, you saw a hamstring uh, presentation. I know – uh, there's been so much talk this year about the NFL and a million hamstring injuries. Um, what, what were, what was the talk there? Well, the talk, this was very interesting. And this was one of the things that I wanted to, to mention in the podcast. And I'm going to actually mention it to Chris Poirier. Cause what they did 
in a lot of these talks. So the Google one was a one-on-one where the woman from Google sat. There were two interviewers, very much like being on Jimmy Kimmel or something, where they sat and she was interviewed by a moderator. Same thing, James Kerr interviewed a rugby strength coach. And in the hamstring one, a doctor had a, another doctor, a physical therapist, and actually a guy named Michael Owen, who, if you know soccer, is extremely famous. But as, of course, those of us in the good old ugly US of A don't recognize, he won the Balloon d'Or, which is the, uh, the outstanding player in um, the world a couple of times for, as an English player but had had two severe hamstring injuries, one where he actually tore his hamstring right off the bone in his sort of ischial attachment and had to have Mm. surgery in one non-surgical. But he ended up being kind of the center of the discussion because he was Mm. very well-spoken and was very able to present now this sort of mature athlete perspective because he was like a guy who burst on the scene as a 17-year-old and the national team and was already playing for a Premier League team at 17 and was, you know, the leading scorer and, you know, the, the best player on England's national team and all this stuff. And he talked a lot about the pressure, both that he placed on himself and the pressure that he felt from, from the trainers and from the physios. So it ended up, I don't know if it was where it was supposed to go, but it very much went into sort of the psychology of dealing with these injuries and these guys being pressured to play and managers pressuring players to play when they weren't ready and doctors not. The notes that I wrote down, it was very interesting, and I've said this before, but I, I realized that our job very often in strength and conditioning with the young player is to protect them from themselves in terms of he said, you know, I'm 17, I'm bulletproof, I'm just thinking, put me back out, I'm okay, when I know that I'm not, and I realize I've got a, a big problem, he said, and then later on, you know, I'm in sort of the opposite situation where now I've be, learned to become my own advocate and I'm telling them, nope, I'm not ready, and I'll tell you when I'm ready. So it was just really cool to sort of see. And I think it was, I felt like it was really good for the people that were there that were in management to see the perspective of this elite athlete. As he was saying, he said, you know, whether I played or not mattered. It mattered to the organization. It mattered financially. It mattered to the manager who was maybe, you know, a day away from losing his job. He said there were a lot of things, you know, a lot of people that had a lot hinging on whether or not I was going to be able to run at full speed. And so uh, it, that, you know, it didn't even get into as much the um, kind of the mechanisms and treatment of the injury as it did the athlete perspective. So I thought that was probably for me, one of the more enjoyable ones. Very cool. Um, Coach, let's talk about a forum thread. And I had actually, um, emailed you when I read your response because I was like, wow, this this could be a great article because I loved your response. But I'll just set it up. There was uh, somebody had talked about working with 13 to 15 year olds and 13 and 14 year olds. And, and one of the biggest challenges they were facing was that from an engagement perspective, um, some of them were very distracted and they weren't really, um, you know, their behavior wasn't always the greatest, blah, blah, blah. Um, and I loved your response in terms of they should be learning, you know, that there's a serious aspect to training and that you felt like you, sh- that, you know, you should be, ad- you advocated removing those that are most disruptive. That really gets the message across. You have to learn to be tight but loose. You establish boundaries and it's a constant push-pull. And I, on the other hand, you know, you said um, – on the flip side, you have to develop relationships with those problem kids and realize that winning them over is the goal, not kicking them out. Kicking them out should be the last resort. I thought this was a great, like, to expand on this idea in terms of the art of, this is really the art of coaching. Um, talk to us about, about this idea. Yeah, well, you know, I think that it's probably the thing that we have done the best at Mike Boyle Strength and Conditioning and probably what ends up being a real strength for us with our our kids programming or our youth programming is that not letting it deteriorate into a grab ass babysitting kind of thing. Because again, for your coaches, no one wants to coach those groups when you've got particularly the, the worst of the worst are the say 11, 12, 13 year old boys. They're absolutely the, the worst kids to deal with. And a lot of times you end up in situations where no one wants to coach that group. It's like, Oh God, I don't want to take that group of kids because they, they, they're they paying the ass, they don't listen. And they're, you know, they're, they're motor morons on top, so they're not good at. 
and so the, the things that I wrote were kind of the things that I do tell the staff in terms of, okay, if you've got, you know, if you've got a ringleader, get them out. If it's always that guy, you know, who's whacking somebody in the butt or, you know, doing something stupid, get them out or at least threaten to do it. And, and we've had, it's funny. Uh, you know, what we usually do is we threat, we tell the kids, Hey, we're going to take your, we're going to bring you to the office. We're going to write you a check for the balance and we're going to give it to you and tell you to give it to your parents. So I'm going to call your parents and tell them that we asked you to leave, that you were disruptive, that you didn't listen and that the group would be better off without you. Most of the time, these kids are white faced when this is happening to them, realizing like, Oh my God, my dad's going to kill me. But interestingly enough, we had one kid maybe six months ago. It's like, fine, my dad's outside. I'm leaving. And he walked out and we're thinking, okay, good riddance. Hope he hope he never comes back. <laughs> He walks back in in tears five minutes later because he went out thinking he's going to tell his dad what happened and his dad's going to support him. And his dad did not support him. His dad, in fact, said, you go in, you apologize. <laughs> you tell those guys that you're going to be a good boy and you're going to do what you're supposed to do. Nice. So in some ways you figure out, okay, do I have a, a parent who's a pain in the ass enabler and I'm better off without their kid? Or do I have a parent who's actually going to be a little bit of a disciplinarian and tell their kids, it's embarrassing but as a parent to be the person who's sitting outside and realize, okay, my son's team is in there and they just sent my son out to me in the car and told him to leave because he can't listen and follow directions. You don't want to be that parent. I know that. Cause I'm, I mean, if that was my kid, yeah. he knows, you know what I mean? He, he'd literally, he'd be crying before he got in the car trying to explain to yeah. me what had happened to him because he would know what my reaction was going to be. And, and so you do have to have that hammer present Yet at the same time, you have to realize that the flip side of that is talking to the kids and realizing, you know, what team they play for and, and being able to engage them so that they want to listen to you. And, and so when I, that's why I said the push pull idea it really is literally push pull. And I always say, and like, for me, I always try to focus even because I have my daughter Michaela's team and they're actually the worst of the worst in terms of, they're 17 and 19. They all know each other and they cannot stop talking to each other and <laughs> giggling and interrupting. I mean, they're really the worst. And, and it's, it's almost embarrassing that I can say that my daughter's team is the worst team that we have in terms of behavior. But I think I can safely say that they are. And part of it is because with them, there really aren't a lot of parents involved because a lot of these kids have come from other places and, you know, you, the worst groups are teams where everybody knows each other. And it's not like college. You can't go off on these kids like you could with a college team. Because they're, they're basically a bunch of high school girls. So you, you really are constantly feathering this relationship. Is there any, is there any silent, silent warm up days? Okay. I, I want to, <laughs> our goal is to try to not speak during the entire warm-up. I mean, I figure out like these kind of stupid yeah. games that we can play with them that will hopefully make this thing work. Is there any element, Sorry, there anyway. is there any element of it being a little bit of, ah, it's Michaela's dad, you know, we're okay here, you know? Oh yeah, absolutely. Yep. That's, and then, cause, I mean, I told him a couple of weeks ago, I said, okay, here's the deal. We're trying to get a good solid warm-up done where you can get better, where you can roll, where you can stretch, where you can do uh, what you're supposed to. I said, we can warm up with a five mile assault bike ride. I said, if that's what you want to do, I said, that's what we'll do. And I had the coach is a former athlete of ours too. And I said, Danielle will support it. If I tell her that, okay, they just won't shut up. They won't listen. So we're going to ride five miles on the assault bikes and then get into our lift. And then suddenly they were kind of like, Oh, he's actually, he's pissed. Now he's really not happy with us. But but they all know, I know them all. I like them all. Do you know what I mean? And they know that. So it is, that's usually part of what makes it the worst thing is that these are all kids that I have a personal relationship with. They're all kids that I know probably better than I know anybody else in the facility, but they're also not the mature elite athletes that I want them to be. And so you have this, you know, and usually the thing is now like they're great in the lift because they get broken up into small groups and they have much, you know, they have, they're more tasked. Like, okay, I need, you need to do boom, 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 boom. And they're worse in the warm up when they're all together and sort of giggling. I always say, I say they come in and you would think they've been together. 
a half hour before they got off the ice and then they got in their cars and they drove to the gym. And then you'd think they hadn't seen each other in six months, the way they need to reconnect and giggle and laugh and talk to each other. And I hate to say it. I do. I occasionally swear at them and I always say to them, I, okay, I'm approaching, shut the F up just so we know that's where I'm getting near. And you don't want to hear me say that. <laughs> and, uh, and then they, they kind of get the message. So, yeah, but it is, I mean, and I will do that article because I think there is a, you, you talk about art of coaching and this is an art of coaching point. That's why I think college coaching is easy. Cause you can just get up in somebody's face and scream at them and kick them out and tell them to go talk to the head coach and make them run. You can do whatever, pretty much whatever you want. They're like prisoners. And, um, particularly if you have a good head coach, like, you know, what I, when I had coach Parker at BU, I mean, those guys knew, I mean, you get kicked out, like, you know, somebody got kicked out there and I said, go, go see coach Parker before you come back. He was like, Oh my God, I can't believe I screwed up like this. You know, I can't believe I got to go to his office and tell him that that Mike <laughs> kicked me out of the weight room. Hey, I mean, that was, that yeah. was the disaster of all disasters for a kid to, to know that, you know, he had crossed that line and, and it was funny because I just was in London. I went and spent the day with Chad Forsyth and uh, Barry Solon at Arsenal. And now you go and you've got a whole different thing because now you're back to the relationship thing because you've got professionals who don't have to. I don't know, I'll tell you yeah. my Josh Becker story. The first time I talked to Josh, I don't even know if I'm going to like you. I don't know if I'm going to even talk to you. Definitely not going to listen to you. <laughs> and I was like, okay, this is a really good, <laughs> a good first step. I'm really looking forward to working with you. <laughs> And we ended up having a great relationship, but the first phone didn't go all that well. And the difference with him is, you know, he's a Cy Young Award winner. He's one of the best, you know, at that time, one of the best pitchers in baseball. And, and you're kind of thinking, okay, I don't have a lot of leverage right now with this guy. So I better get to know him and like him. And he better get to the point where he trusts that I'm here to help him get better so that we can kind of move this thing forward. And I was able to do that. But again, in the, at the pro level, and I talked about this at Arsenal, what I did right, I was, I mean, I was lucky in the sense that when I got to the Red Sox, we had 11 guys in the disabled list. So 11 guys who had had surgery who were rehabbing at spring training. And I just started training those guys. I just started scheduling them in during the day where I had say, you know, after they get done with their treatment, we did a 45 minute session. And the players that were healthy almost got a little bit jealous in terms of, you know, guys were like, you know, when do I get scheduled in? You know, how come you meet this guy at six o'clock in the morning? You know, blah, blah, blah. I was like, well, you know, I started out, you know, priority, top priority was, to, you know, the guys in the DL getting those guys better. But guys were actually a little bit offended that it's like, hey, I'm here, I'm healthy. You know, I'm going to help the team right now. You should be training me. But I ended up in a situation where by winning the trust of these guys that were injured, I suddenly got the trust of the guys that were healthy. Yeah, that's awesome. Great stuff, Coach. Um, wow, it's been uh, we're overtime. Um, yeah, I was going to say I did. I did my usual. I managed. I can make five minutes into twenty five better than anybody in the industry. Yeah, on my new podcast, when I get you on, it's it's uh, it's only twenty minutes. So I gotta really, I gotta, I'm 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 not getting you on early on in the show. I gotta maneuver everybody around, and really get my chops together to make sure I can control you when you're on the show. So <laughs> well, you've got to be able to just. I think just decide the one question you want to ask. There you go. <laughs> All right, Coach, we'll talk to you next time. All right, thanks, Dan. All right, now it's time for the Ask the Equipment Experts with Perform Better, and I am here with the lovely, talented, and slightly, or maybe more than slightly, under the weather, Aaron McGurr. Aaron, thanks for coming on. (laughs) Thanks for having me. All right, well... Tomorrow, I get to see you. I will wave to you. I'm not going to give you a kiss this time. Uh, oh, thanks. <laughs> um, Smart. Let's, let's start off with the holiday sale. What do you got? Uh, right, now, right now, we are having our holiday sale. There is up to 40% off. Um, it's similar to the summer sale. A lot of our top products, so rollers, bands, sandbags. Um, we have a lot of our medicine balls on sale. Elite Med balls are, are almost 40% off. Soft toss are 30% off. I know the jam balls are 40% off. So 
Um, we even have racks on sale because obviously you need medicine ball racks to hold all of your medicine balls that you're going to get on this awesome sale. But uh, definitely a great time to buy if you know anyone that is in the fitness industry, which if you're listening to this, you probably are. Um, it's always a great idea to get some gifts. So I would say check it out. Very cool. Well, like I said, I'm going to see you tomorrow in New Jersey one day, perform better one day. Um, We've already talked about it, but the, when's the next one? Because actually, when people listen to this, it's after uh, the one day. When's the next one? The next one is going to be in January. So it's January 21st in San Francisco. Um, I probably shouldn't say this. I'm probably going to get in a lot of trouble, but there is somebody's special big birthday on that day. So if anyone's in the area or if anyone's going to stop by, um, I'll give you a hint. His name's Chris, and he's the boss. So he nice. will be out there, um, but he will be celebrating a significant birthday that day. So definitely stop by and give him some happy birthday wishes. Very cool. Won't say nothing about Don't the big... Don't tell him I said that. <laughs> won't say nothing about the big five-o. Won't say a word. Whoa. Um, <laughs> I didn't say it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just got the new catalog, and you got a bunch of new products. You wanted to talk today about the new PB Extreme line, Glute Ham. Talk to us about that. Yeah. Well, I know Rob was on here uh, last time mentioning the Power Rack, and we started off with our PB Extreme line with the half rack and some dumbbells and our adjustable bench. Um, and over time, it's just been growing. We've had some great success with it. So we did come out with our Power Rack, like I said, Rob talked about. And we've been getting a lot of requests for a glute ham as well. So we did come out with a glute ham this year. Um, and it's actually, I love it. It is similar to our adjustable bench, how it has a hydraulic lift. So in order to raise the feet, you actually just can uh, pop it out and it has a hydraulic lift to raise it so there's no kind of shimmying a pin or anything like that to raise it. It does have a walk-through design, which is nice because I know a lot of them, there's kind of the bar going through and people have to toss their leg over and it's just uncomfortable. So it is a walk-through design, which is nice. Um, there's 12 different linear adjustments, so it does fit everyone of all different heights and sizes. And then uh, there's band attachments in the front. The front pad does flip over, so it can go a full 360. It's flat on one side if you want to do reverse hypers uh, and use it like a Roman chair or anything like that. So there's a lot of different options for it. Again, it is the first time we've come out with a glute ham, but it's been such a great addition to our PB Extreme line, so I'm excited to kind of get some feedback and see what people think of it. All right, very cool. Well, you guys are really doing a great job uh, with that line and, and uh, love to see all the new stuff. So um, I am going to let you go because I don't want to get any hate mail because I let the little <laughs> sick girl on the show with her sniffles. And, um, and then, uh, you know, I don't want to perform better to get in trouble because they're sending you down in New Jersey even though you're sick as a dog. So. <laughs> we will tell. Anyway, e, thanks for coming on. Looking forward to seeing you. Thanks for having me. Hey everybody, welcome back to the Results Fitness University Business of Fitness segment uh, here on the Strength Coach, Coach Podcast, where we try to give you some tips and ideas to really grow your business, make more money and impact more lives. Uh, this episode, I want to talk about a concept that, that at Results Fitness we call the executive athlete. What happens is over time, if you're in the fat loss market or the general fitness market and you're charging, let's say you're charging $300 a month, $250 a month, and you're delivering a great product, at some point, your clients lost all the fat that they're, they're going to get. Their original reasons for hiring you have been met. They've reached their goal, and they're extremely happy with your services and what you've done. But at your price point, you might be a little too expensive for them to just maintain, to just maintain what they're doing and continue with the, their training program. So they might leave. And that's where this program comes in, the executive athlete. At some point, it's almost like you have to have a graduate program for your clients. So if you think about a university, at some level people finish their bachelor's degree or their associate's degree, and the next level is a bachelor's or a master's degree, or you can continue your studying to PhD level and so on. In martial arts, once you get your green belt, you move on, you get your blue belt, you get your red belt, you get your black belt. You get your black belt, you get your second degree black belt. So there's a continuum, there's graduation programs built in place. Fitness, we don't really have that. People develop their fitness and they get into great great shape, but at some point they're like, you know, I've reached my goals and now I'm paying you just to maintain. I could probably maintain on my own. 
That's where we create this thing we call the Executive Athlete Program, where we select events for the clients. Right, upcoming right now. Last weekend uh, we did a 5K race in town, and we train people for the 5K. We've got a Spartan race coming up. We also do other types of mud runs, which are a little lower level than the Spartan race. We do triathlons, uh, powerlifting meets. But the idea is, you're not. It's not like training an athlete where they have a specific goal, where they have a specific event. You're picking the events and you're building the periodization for the client. So think of a client you have that that maybe she's lost a bunch of body fat and she's getting strong and, and you know she's starting to become that badass client, right? At some point she's thinking about, you know, I don't know if I'll continue paying this just to maintain. I need a new goal. And that's when they might leave. You come up with the goal and go, all right, I think you should think about doing this Spartan race or this mud run. We could put together a team. But the way we do it at the gym is we, we set these events up and we put people together. We do extra, we, we charge a small fee and we do extra training sessions. The fee usually includes the extra training sessions, uh, a full training program, a uh, t-shirt of some kind, some type of identification or tri building technique, and then a coach being at the event on the day to coach you through it. But these things are super popular, whether they're 5K races, powerlifting. We just sent two people to the Nationals for powerlifting. We've got a team of about 25 people doing the next Spartan race. But these are people, they're, they're graduating out of our general fitness program and becoming athletes. The term we use is the executive athlete. But it's someone who's, you know, they're doing different things. They're, 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 they're a multitask athlete. They're not just someone who just runs 5K and 10Ks. That's a runner. And you're doing a sports performance program. Someone who just plays golf, that's a golfer and you have a golf-specific program. These are people that might do a multitude of things. They might do a triathlon or a mud run or something like that. So we, our term is the executive athletes. And you can call them what you want. It's really a graduate program for people to move out of general fitness and see the other things that you can offer them. See some of the advanced programming you can do, some of the different things you can do. So if you've been on for a while and you've got clients that have been with you for a while, Start looking for some of these local events, 5Ks, bike rides, triathlons, mud runs, powerlifting meets, and a whole bunch of other sort of athletic contests that you can direct your clients to as the next level for their fitness. So that's it for this week. Any questions, please post them in the Business of Fitness section over at strengthcoach.com. This is Alan Cosgrove from resultsfitnessuniversity.com, and I will talk to you guys next time. All right, now it's time for the Hit the Gym with the Train Coach segment, and today I have on Justin Cavanaugh from the Sport and Speed Institute in Northern Virginia. Coach Cavanaugh has trained a boatload of um, a boatload of athletes in general, but uh, really known for his combine uh, sk- combine training and some football training. And a former athlete himself. Um, I've just been following some of his stuff lately and really been interested in it. Coach, thanks for coming on today. Thank you for having me, Anthony. All right. Well, you have a wealth of knowledge on your on your site just on speed. Uh, you know, you are you are the CEO of the Sport and Speed Institute. You have all this experience with the combine training. So some great videos that you did. Let's let's start out there. Let's go with um, talk to me about speed training and your philosophy on speed training. Well, thanks for having me, first of all, Anthony. I think the amount of knowledge that you guys are able to push into the industry is just great. So I just want to first say thank you. But, um, you know, diving into the subject of speed, which is, you know, frankly, it's it's entertaining. It's the, it's, the, it's the marketing grab, and that's where a lot of people come to us. And it's just how do we get there, right? So it's one thing to get people into the door from a business standpoint, which is everyone knows us as like the speed facility. And yet when they come in here, I think it's, it's very educational for them on how we kind of acquire – um, you know, both all of our speed mechanisms. So, and I, you know, I think it's really, you know, it's, it's interesting because everybody wants to do drills. They want to do all the fancy stuff, but if they don't do the meat and potatoes of it, uh, they, they just won't get faster. So I think speed comes down to relative body strength, frankly. Um, you know, if you look on the site, you look on, you know, just the history of speed, it's real simple, stride length, stride frequency. And it's just, how do we get that? Right. So there's angles, there is uh, strength, and then there's flexibility. It's it's pretty simple. It, it doesn't need to be that complicated. It only needs to be very complicated when you're dealing with the one percent of the world. But to get this, you know, the majority of our clientele, which are even even at the NFL Combine level, they're not even at that. They're not even at the speed, you know, 
um, efficiency of the guys at the Olympics. So for us to kind of like dive in so deep there, it's not, uh, it's not necessary where they are in their life. So, you know, we have a full development program from a speed standpoint, which is going to start out with movement and coordination. And then it's going to build once they start working on strength work to then layering that into you know, your plyometrics and, and then some of the other speed drills that become very, in my opinion, you know, very, very effective once you already have that base. So, you know, our philosophy on speed is, is everything that you're doing. And what I, when it means everything, I'm talking like when you walk into the facility and, and they start, you know, you turn on and I'm training now, is that going to transfer to sport? And if it doesn't, you shouldn't be doing it. And I think that's where, you know, we differ as a, as a company and a facility than a lot of other people, because our, our philosophy is really simple. It's, it's results driven. If it works, we do it. If it doesn't work, then, and it, there's not enough proof that it works then why am I going to waste my time on it? That's what we call, you know, that's the fun stuff. That's later. So, you know, everything that we do from, from the time that we have the athletes start with us to the last training session they have, it needs to be very thought out and planned. And there are certain things that we understand when it comes to speed development that is going to get your greatest impact. And that is just basic posture, number one, and then understanding, um, your basic speed mechanism. So like understanding that it's your upper body is a driver to your lower body and that if you don't have coordination, right, then you're not going to, no matter what you do on the, on the strength side, you lose a lot of, of, of the efficiency of speed. So it comes down to efficiency and effectiveness. And there's a lot of different ways that we can make that happen. But in, in the majority of our athletes, it's, it's really basic, right? It's, it's position, it's foot strike, body angle, and, and, and then just understanding, you know, their body awareness. So it's really simple, but yet so sometimes on how we get there, it could be very different for every athlete. Absolutely. Let's, uh, let's expand on kind of your foundation. Talk to me about when, like, like you said, when, you, when, when the athlete's walking in, what is that foundation that you're trying to work on? Um, when it comes to speed directly or the whole pitcher of the athlete? Really? Yeah, the whole pitcher. I think that, you know, as coaches, we have a, an amazing, you know, responsibility and an opportunity because both the athlete and their parent or, or their coach have kind of entrusted us with their development. And, and if you talk to people that are now after sports, kind of their biggest impact or their biggest things that kind of, um, made a difference in their life, they, a lot of people relate, you know, what they've learned to sports or from sports. And I think that it's a, it's a great opportunity because the game is one thing. Right. Like we you're going to play two, two and a half hours on a Friday night at high school and, and in college, potentially. That's that's just a small piece of of the amount of time that you're going to be working in that sport. The majority of your time is in practice and in training for that sport. So I think we have an opportunity to teach life lessons and to develop the athlete as a complete person. So we very we look at things holistically. It's mind, body and spirit and I truly believe that, you know. When when we work with athletes now people come to us maybe because we're experts in the in the area of body but if we could really affect their mind and their confidence in the way that they develop as a person I think we can make a huge impact now when you talk about on the spiritual side of things um, you know that's getting a little bit deeper and it might take some time you know to get there or you know, just more trust to get there. So found, you know, from a foundation standpoint, I think everything that we do as coaches is just based upon the factor of trust. If we don't have trust, we can't move forward. And what happens with a lot of coaches is they want to kind of, you know, they want to force their experience onto a, uh, onto an athlete or their education onto an athlete. And you have to have buy-in first. So my entire philosophy, in my opinion, comes down to two things. It comes down to what type of an athlete is it? Is it the athlete that you have to bring a horse to water and you have to let them drink, right? And you can't force them because they're in the development phases. Or when it comes to my NFL combine type athlete where they're paying me for a job and my entire reputation is based upon it and I have to bring them to water, but then I have to slam their head in the bucket and they have an option. Either they drink or they drown. And it's two different types of athletes. And there's many different you know, ways that we get them there. But when you talk about the NFL combine athlete that says, hey, I'm putting my entire career in your hands for eight weeks to get ready for maybe something that's going to take less than eight minutes throughout the entire day, like being 
interviewed and, and, and evaluated, it, there's not that much time that's involved, but the preparation is eight weeks full time, seven days a week. You know, I have, you know, my name's on the line. So I'm going to have to like slam their head in the water. Either you're going to do it and you're going to choose to do it, or it's just, it, you know, you go to a different direction. But if you're in the development of the athlete, you got to like slowly give them what, when they're ready. And I believe that's the same thing with our training programs. You got to give the athlete, even if the, the best exercise in the world that you think is going to get the best impact, if they're not ready for it physically, you could do more harm than good. So we've taken that same philosophy dealing with the person than we do dealing with the athlete. Very cool. Yeah, that's, uh, I think just kind of looking on your blog and, and listening to some of your videos and watching your videos, um, I could see that approach and that commitment that you really try to get them to buy into. So very cool. Um, let's, let's circle back to the speed training. I was watching one of your videos and, you know, you're talking again, you just said about stride length, stride frequency. Um, stride length, you were talking about flexibility. Talk to us about your 20 to 20 uh, method. So that's, you know, based upon the flexibility side of things and, and stretching. You know, I'm a big believer of, of static stretching. I, I kind of had a track background and, and I, I hate to use the word track background because there was a, I was basically an average track athlete. I did the decathlon. I did other events as well. Um, but you basically, I kind of sucked at everything, but I was just good enough to kind of be in that, that world. Um, and I've never seen a guy getting ready for the hundred meters, uh, not stretch. And I'm, I understand that very few of them end up getting hurting from stretch, from stretching. So the idea that we need to go do dynamic warmups, yes, it's a part of it, but I, I'm a big believer that stretching is a, is a key factor. And the only coaches and people that don't like stretching are people that are not flexible. So um, we give them a very simple plan that basically it's, you know, 20 seconds, you know, hold a position. Once you're able to do that, you build up to the two minute mark. Once you're able to do that, I want you to hold that position for 20 minutes. The best part about this 22, 20 model is that nobody's going to ever do it. It's almost like the idea that if, if you say, Hey, I asked my athletes two questions. Number one is like, how bad do you want it? You say you want to play in the NFL. You say you want to play college football. How bad do you want it? And they said they want it real bad. And then I ask them, I tell them exactly what it's going to take to get there. And I, I say, well, do you have what it takes? And then they, they get to make their decisions because most athletes aren't going to do it. But if we give them a system, then it just say, hey, they could check the 20-second uh, box off. Hey, did you get to two minutes yet? Oh, no, coach, I did it. Okay, well, let's check that box off and let's do that. And then once we're there, then let's talk about instead of you sitting on your butt on the couch, let's spend your time maybe just – on the floor right in front of your couch and, and be holding that position. And I find that, you know, if you just give athletes strategies and have a game plan, then you're giving them digestible pieces of information that we know are going to benefit them long term. And we understand that sitting is a huge problem, but we can't fix, you know, American uh, posture by just telling them don't sit down. We got to give them some other solutions. So sit down on the floor. Put yourself in a better position. You, you need to be on a hard surface because if if springs or foam is going to, you know, ho hold the base of your body, it's going to kind of contour to that environment. So we kind of want to work your body around objects versus you, your body moving toward uh, contouring to them. So, you know, our thought process is if we could get you to do 20 seconds, I could build you to two minutes and then build you to, to, to 20 minutes. And we find that in the rest periods, it gives the athletes something that they could either check the box off or I could look at and say, maybe you don't want it that bad. I, you know, it's funny because I was – when I was listening to the original, you know, from the video, I was like, 20 minutes, come on. I mean, I got to find out from Coach, you know, who the hell is doing that. But really, it's it's in the process. I love that. I love that explanation. And I love those, you know, the look, these, these are your three. We're breaking it down. And it's just something, it's part of the process. And I, I really like that. I like the way you did that. Um, good stuff. Um, let's talk about about strength, because actually there's a huge, uh, I forget who's on Facebook right now, Devin McConnell, Coach Boyle, um, a few other guys, I forget, um, oh man, who started it, and it's about how strong we need to be, and I've asked this, co this question many times on, on the podcast, talk to me about, um, about how strong you feel like you need to get your athletes with 
because, you know, again, you with for speed training, for getting them faster, because there's a lot of different philosophies on this. So any, any level of strength without you being able to use it is a waste. Now, I can't define that. Like, there's no way that we're able to look at a squat, a bench, a deadlift as like the powerlifting triad and say, okay, that athlete's now too strong. But we understand that, you know, if in the sport of football, it's a mass sport. Like, if you don't have the weight, you're not going to win. But if you don't have the speed, you're not going to maybe even get there. So it's like, you know, kind of, you know, it's, it's a battle, right? And I think it's all about relative body strength. If you look at like fighters, pound for pound, that kid is explosive. And I think that's the word that you want to use is like, is, are your athletes explosive? And you know, we, could, we could basically correlate that in the weight room, you know, by percentages and numbers. And we could look at it and go, okay, that, that guy's strong. Can you do eight pull-ups, you know, at body weight and you're a female athlete? Or if you're a, a college football player training, can you do 15 body weight pull-ups, full range of motion? You're, you're generally, you know, relative body strength is going to be pretty high. Um, so I don't, I'm not looking for benchmarks like they do at the college level where two, two times body weight in the squat or, you know, body weight and a half for bench. Those things don't matter to me if they can't strike the ground and use that strength that they have to produce force. So, you know, what I look at is, you know, we talked back on going back on the subject of stride length or stride frequency. If you look at stride length, Everyone thinks that it's flexibility driven. And yes, that's, you know, I'm one of those people that say, yes, it is flexibility because it's about, you know, contact on the right foot to contact on the left foot as you run. But the more force that you put into the ground allows you to, you know, basically float and and create more separation because of the more force that you have. And a weak athlete won't be able to do that. You're not going to be able to cover as much ground if you can't put force into the ground and maintain a certain angle. So as far as how strong you need to be, I don't know that answer. But what I do know is that if you're not strong relative to your body weight, you won't be able to move well. So I'm looking for an explosive athlete. And the only way I could look for an explosive athlete is if they could move their body weight and they can move it at a rapid pace. So I'm looking for kind of key indicators, broad jumps and repeated broad jumps, because again, that's understanding angles and force and their body weight. If you're a fat athlete, you're not moving very fast. And so these are some of the things that we look at. Um, as far as stride frequency goes, like the optimization phase between when the, the, the foot strikes the ground and the amount of time that it takes for that foot to uh, touch the ground and then toe off and strike the ground again, you know, the stiffer you are as an athlete, the faster you're going to be, but you're not going to be stiff if you're weak. Because then you're going to have, you know, you're going to go through full range of motion and you don't want that. So I think it's, it's understanding, you know, a body angle. And if they can't get into that angle, then we know that they're, they're weak. So what happens is, is we talked about efficiency and effectiveness. So the efficient athlete is using the least amount of effort as possible, you know, in every movement. They understand it. They're at a right angle. The effective athlete is striking the ground in the right angle, in the right position. So what happens is if they're very effective because they have strength and they strike the ground, but they're not being very efficient with their movements and they're hitting it at the wrong angle because they don't have the strength to be able to keep their body angle low towards the ground, then it doesn't matter. And that's why if you look at a lot of these combine programs, they have these athletes in these really aggressive angles, and then they stumble out of the blocks. It's because they don't have the necessary strength to keep their body from falling. But yet if they were able to drive back into the ground, they're going to create momentum and drive forward because that inertia is just going to push you down. And if you're able to have enough strength to maintain your body weight on a single leg and drive back and then repeatedly do that with even you know more you know, more of an angle each step, then what ends up happening is you end up starting to drive your hips up and then get into a more of a top speed. So acceleration, which we know is in sport, the most important thing, it comes down to that angle. And every time I see an athlete that's in an angle, but can't maintain, you know, is breaking instead of producing force, they're not strong enough to maintain that angle. So if you just, as a simple, as a simple evaluation, as a coach, if you literally just watch somebody from a profile view, and you watch them lean forward or do a push-up start, so a falling start or a push-up start, and the way their foot strikes the ground, if they're ever breaking in any way, they're not strong enough for that position. So that's the easiest way that I know how to define relative body strength 
for a, an athlete that wants to focus on speed. Great stuff. Um, coach, what are some maybe mistakes that you feel like you've made in speed training in the past or some, some, some mistakes you see out there that other coaches are making? Well, I mean, mistakes, I think I've made quite a few of them. <laughs> you know, you, and we're probably still making them today. And I think the biggest shift, and, you know, frankly, I think the biggest shift was like about a decade ago for us, which was doing the most important things first. You know, I, I used to be in the, in, in the bucket of like, well, you know, in order to get these guys, we have to do all the fun stuff. And then I kind of shut that down because I realized like if we only do that and we do that first – we're, we're, we're putting the most important things on the back end and we might not have the same level of intent to move. The athlete might be a little tired or they might not think that is as important. So what happens is their intention starts to change. And when their intention change in their movement or in their exercise, then what happens is we don't get the most out of it. And I need to get the most out of the most important thing that day. So that was probably the biggest mistake I think we've made over the years. And it's just putting the big rocks in first. So, you know, our athletes know, I mean, you know, when it comes to the speed side of things, the exercise we're going to do, we're almost going to do the same things every day. Cause if they do those really, really well, we could start doing the fun stuff. And what I mean by that is push up start series, um, you know, reactional starts and, um, falling starts. And if we could do those three things really well, then we can start adding the fun stuff. We could add some resistance to it. We could do some of the, you know, the things that we do with uh, more on the specialization side. But if you start specialization first, you don't have enough base to build off of. And if you think about it, the best athletes in the world aren't specializing until they're, they've, they've plateaued. It's the, it's the same idea of a cheat meal from a, a nutrition standpoint. You don't get a cheat meal if you eat bad 50% of the time. So you don't get a fun exercises, uh, you know, a fun exercise if you don't do that first. Absolutely. I, well, I guess it would, you know, not in your defense, but, you know, I think sometimes a lot of coaches will look at it and kind of think of, I'm trying to teach the skill, right, too. So you want, it's, it's almost like the chicken or the egg sometimes with some people. It feels like if we want to teach the skill because we want, we, you know, we want to make sure that they know what they're doing. We don't want to. We want to make sure their movement patterns are right. So I guess it, it could be a, a, you know, a process. Yeah, but if you're a defensive back or a quarterback or a, you know, a linebacker and you're trying to teach the skill of that movement and they can't do it, you got to ask them, is it because they are bad at skill acquisition or they don't have the necessary tools to get into that position regardless? And if they don't have the strength to get into that angle, then it doesn't matter how well you coach it. They're just going to have a, a compensation pattern to put themselves in that position. If I, you know, if I, if I, you know, today with my back and all the surgeries that I've had on my spine, if I try to swing a golf club like I did even recreationally, the way I did, you know, ten years ago, I can't do it anymore. I compensate because I don't have the range of motion. Athletes, I think, what people don't understand is that the at a high level, even at a um, a, a high level high school level, most athletes that are good athletically are master manipulators of their body. So they understand how to manipulate the drill that you coach, even if it's not the right, you know, what we want them to do. I mean, you, we've all had athletes in our building that we do strength training with. And then during that exercise, they say, I feel it in a different area. And it's just because it's not because that area is not on, you know, they say like things turn on or off. That's not what it is. It's just that they're compensating the position and pattern to, to utilize what they're good at. And if you look at gymnasts, like young, a young gymnast doesn't have the strength to hold themselves in certain positions. So they just leverage that. And what, that's the same thing that we do in speed is that the athlete doesn't have the strength to, you know, maintain their body in a good position. So what do they do? They just, they just, you know, drive their foot out a little bit or they open it up or they change their posture. And, and by doing that, that's manipulating the leverage point, but that's not actually helping them. That's helping them for that, that moment, but that's a very short term look. And if you take a long term look at the athlete, you could start to say, I'm going to give you as a sport coach more tools to make sure when they make a cut that they know how to get the hell out of the hole because they have the strength to be able to do so. Absolutely. I think uh, it just reminded me, Coach Boyle always used to say, 
you know, the best athletes sometimes can be the best cheaters of movement. So you got to kind of always be careful of that. Interesting. Um, yeah, and there's two ways to do that. If you do it, one, by just manipulating the drill because you want to win, right? So, I mean, we I'm a big 10 yeah. yards guy because I'm all acceleration based. I mean, if you think about the NFL combine, if I can increase somebody's stance, you know, in their first step into their 10 yard, I win. But if we start timing that and we start competing against each other, by the time they get to the six, seven yard mark, these guys are over striding. So it sets them up for a bad transition. And a lot of companies, they want to focus only on the 10 yard and they go, look what I improved. I improved your 10 yard sprint. But you also screwed up their 40 in the end because they have no transitional ability. So they'll start over striding because, yeah, they're going to get there faster, but that's not the end goal. The end goal is to put yourself in a better position to transition. Just like as a DB, if I'm backpedaling and I make a good – if I T-step versus doing a run-through, I'm going to be blocked off to, to, to the field side. But people don't understand that, and you have to be able to give the, them better tools so when you give the sport coach a better athlete, they have a better tool to get out of there. And, and that's the way we look at it because, yeah, they can, they can manipulate the, the, the drill to win or they can manipulate the, the drill to make it easier on them. And I don't think either one of those are more effective. Absolutely. Good stuff, Coach. Um, I was watching a video. So let's get to some of the fun stuff. we got to give them some of the fun stuff. Um, I was uh, watching a video, uh, and anybody can sign up at your site and watch this video. It's about 12 minutes. Great stuff. Sportandspeedteam.com. It was the five drills that you kind of get some of your athletes to do, you know, they could do every night. Um, again, we were talking earlier about, you know, get that consistency and that discipline. And, you know, do you, do you, are you willing to do what it takes? So talk to us about just uh, these five drills that you, uh, you had one of your athletes going over in the video. It was great. It was a great video, by the way. Awesome. Well, much appreciated. You know, it's really simple. I mean, uh, in that video, there's an you know an NFL athlete in there. He got a national championship quarterback at the college level. He played in the NFL, and it's funny because it's the same thing I do with my eight year olds, and and it's it's really interesting because if I had an eight year old doing it, nobody would care. And yeah. it's something that scales. So, you know, I'm just going to talk about three um, right now because I think they're important for everybody to kind of just visualize in their head, and they, we all know them. I think, they're, I think they're all drills that everybody knows. They just won't do them. So with our NFL Combine athletes, we make them do – and I learned this from, from Martin Rooney. And I thought it was really interesting because when he was doing Combine prep, he had his guys every night – I think it was like 10 or 20 minutes um, you know, do arm mechanics in the mirror every single night. So, and I'm a, I'm a jerk. So I was like, I want to make, I'm going to be bigger jerk than Martin. So I'd make them do it 30 minutes a night. And uh, my thought is, is if they do it five days out of the week, you know, then, you know, we're getting an extra, you know, two and a half hours in of training with them doing it on their own. So that was my thought. And I know that a lot of athletes won't do it. So it's also so, uh, same thing, just like the stretching. I could come back and say, did you do that? Did you check that box? If you didn't, then don't bitch at me because you're not where you want to be. But they're really simple. You could do them at home with no equipment. You could do them at any age with any issues. You know, some kids say, well, I can't do that because of the weather or I can't do this because I don't have the equipment. You know, there's no excuse here. If you start eliminating their excuses, we can start getting into the reason why they lack discipline. And then we can start talking and then building those things from there. So the first one is, is arm mechanics. And it's really simple. It's just when our foot strikes the ground. We want our hands to be open. That extension response in our hands is going to create an extension response in our feet. So I want to make sure that they're constantly doing that. And that what that looks like is just like you're measuring your hand up against maybe your dad's when you're a kid or your friends and say, who had a bigger hand? You're going to try to stretch that thumb and that pinky finger as far as apart as possible. And that extension in your hand is going to kind of core, is going to help you know, resonates the rest of the body and, and have an extension in your feet. And when you do that, when your foot strikes the ground, it's stiff. And then it relaxes at an extremely fast rate and then rips into the ground. So we're training mechanisms of the upper body, but yet it's going to then start to transfer to the lower body as well. And, uh, you know, very simple drill, just, you know, thumb to your nose, hand it past your hip pocket, you know, we teach our athletes to get money because if you can't reach inside, you're going to be broke. And it's things like that that is just going to get their buy-in because it's at their, it's speaking their language. And it's something that we're going to start to develop discipline because they're doing it on a regular basis. If they do it every day, they're going to get better at it. And it's also something that I could say, hey, look at your hands. They look bad. Your arm mechanics are poor. Nothing else matters. 
it's one thing to be fast, but if you start to look fast, scouts are going to start taking notice too. So arm mechanics is definitely my, my first and favorite drill because I know that it's it's easy to tell if a kid's being disciplined. If they have poor arm mechanics, they didn't work on it. There, it doesn't take much. Uh, it doesn't take a high level of competency or athleticism to fix your arm mechanics. So the most uncoordinated, you know, twelve year old could do it. So that's the first one. The second one is just a wall. A, a very simple wall drill, and, and, and we've all seen the ones where you know we lean on the wall, and about two, three reps into it, you know the feet started three, four feet away from the wall, and now they're three, four inches of the wall, and the kid's hunched over. You know what I'm talking, Anthony? Like, and it's just crappy posture, and they're doing it all day long. That drives me nuts because yeah, yeah. what's the point of doing a basic drill? Shitty, yeah. right? Just be great at some of the most basic stuff. And the goal of this drill where a lot of people think that it's going to help stride frequency or stride it's, – it's only going to work and focus on posture. It's teaching the athlete. It's giving some ath- an athlete feedback because the wall's there. They should want to feel that when they're running. They're pushing into the ground, and they should want to maintain that – that distance with their feet away from the wall. And if you could look at the side, like we were talking about running the 10 yard sprint, if we could look at the side of the athlete when they're up against the wall and if from their head to their heel, they don't look like a a board and they're not, it's not a straight line. They're wrong. So it's, it's auto, it auto regulates the coaching for you. See, when people work with me, I don't like me directly. I don't use that many cones or drills. I just coach them, you know, just one-on-one. But when we start creating systems within a business and f- developing systems for the athlete, we want the drill to be almost auto-regulating and, uh, and almost be its own coach. And then what happens is, is the art of the coaching is start taking away tools, whether it be cones, hurdles, or walls, and trying to get that same transfer. So we use the wall as just a position, and then we have them drive their knee up so they understand what it's like to feel that position. It's also really good to, if we can get an athlete in that position and they're very aggressive to that wall and they can't hold that or they start to fatigue, we could then start to use that as an example to the athlete and say, hey, you might be able to do some, you know, push some serious weight in the weight room, but if we can't get our body, you know, to, to hold this position, we're definitely weak in some area of the chain. And we could use that as a, as a mechanism to coach the athlete, to get them to buy in, which is very important. And then the third one that I want to talk about today is just a simple high knee drill. Speed is about turning things on or off very quick. So if you think about like a strobe light, like if you're at a party and you just got a strobe light and it's just flickering and then it just builds up speed, it goes doop, 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 and it starts going faster and faster and faster and faster. The faster it gets, right, the more it looks like it's just always on. And it's the same thing with your body. The faster you do high knees, the less deviation you're going to have vertically, the less deviation you're going to have laterally. And then the more consistency and the more efficiency you're going to have with your foot strike to allow yourself to propel yourself forward running. So high knees is a a great drill that you could do stationary and just work on that speed and that repetition. And it's also going to help you give your athlete awareness of their stiffness. And if they lack posture and they lack position, they lack the strength to be able to hold that. So it, all of these drills are almost – they're self-coaching and that's why we have them do them every day because you could literally do these in the mirror or up against the wall and feel a difference. And then when you do it and then you have them run, the athlete goes, oh, I see what you mean. And when you get them to start saying that, you know that you're making a difference in their buy-in towards you and the program and you could do other things that are more important. And if I could get that out of the way 20, 30 minutes at night – and just reinforce it, I know that I'm going to start developing basic habits that when I tell them something really important to do, they're going to be able to jump on and do that. Great stuff. Uh, if anybody wants to see that video, you can uh, go to sportandspeedteam.com um, or uh, you know, and I'll also have that link on traincoachpodcast.com. Coach, let's turn this over to something recently that you wrote that got to be – probably got you a lot of crap – on the internet because people probably just read the title and then didn't read the article uh, like we do on the internet. Um, The heavy hip thrust is ruining our backs and our industry. Talk to us about this article. First, let's go over the, did you get a lot of crap for this? 
So I think my favorite response was being called a hip thrust racist, <laughs> which was awesome. And from a guy that kind of grew up in, in, in Miami and, um, you know, played multiple sports and has, has coached thousands of athletes at this point in my career, that would probably be one of the, um, uh, the one of the the funniest comments, first of all, but one of the uh, probably one of the the best things you could call me because it's like, are you kidding, right? Like, are you like you you basically you missed the point, right? And it's one of those ones where you're just like, wow. So yeah, apparently I'm, I'm I was the most hated person for about three days, and then some people that started to support it that actually have a little bit more recognition than me online. Um, and have better marketers and better online presences, they, um, they become more hated than I did because they, they kind of supported me. So I was like, oh, I appreciate the, uh, the internet, you know, basically, uh, the internet coaches that are, um, that actually coach, you know, jumping on board and supporting it. And then the rest of them that didn't, um, yeah, they, they definitely, uh, it, it basically got some people's panties in a bunch. So, so you guys, you've been, you were doing it, you were doing it, you're basically saying maximally loaded barbell hip thrusts were the ones that were uh, creating the problem with their backs. And as, a, as someone who's obviously suffered from back pain, you know, you know and, and you're working with all these athletes, talk to us about what you were starting to see with, uh, with, the, with the maximally loaded barbell hip thrust. Well, I, I, mean, I think that we all do this. So I'm going to kind of get to where where did it start? Like, where did this idea come from? Of like, is this the, is this a good idea? Like, just thinking logically, right? Is this a good idea to be doing? And it, it seems right. Like, you know, obviously, you know, it's it's very popular now because of a lot of research from certain people. But I think that you should always ask yourself: Is that what I want? Is that what's the most bang for your buck exercise? And is that what we want to do? And, um, what happened is, is some, what I do, we have a staff meeting, you know, pretty, pretty often in, in our staff, I, I want them to bring things to the table. And a lot of our younger coaches were like, we should be doing these, we should be doing these. And I'm like, okay, well, let's throw them in there and see how it responds. And, um, cause you want to get them to, you know, have buy-in too and take ownership of their roles in the building. And so we started doing them. And, and I think the biggest wake up call for me was I was, you know, coming out of, I was, I was training another group on, on the turf and I look into the weight room and I see a kid just finish them and they get up and you just see them put their hands on their hips and, and just kind of lean sideways. Like they're about to just do a little bit of an adjustment. You know what I mean? And I think it's really yeah. interesting when that happens. Cause I'm like, okay, why did that happen? What, what, um, you know, what caused that is my question, right? So I asked, got to ask my that. And I said, okay, let's take a deeper, deeper dive into this subject and look at it and see what's going on. And, you know, right away there wasn't any issues. And then when it happens is you start tracking things. And we have a lot of things in the building that we use for tracking, whether it be, you know, Fusionetics as a software. So we could start figuring out kind of how people's, you know, pain is and what their readiness to train looks like each day. So we started to say, okay, let's let's look at this in, in more depth. And what happened um, through our, you know, just through the experiment of working with kids is, you know, it it didn't feel good for a lot of kids. You know, there's a handful of kids that didn't bother at all, and then there was a group of kids that were like, you know, this this, you know, I'll do it, but it, I don't I don't really like it. And I'm like, well, why don't you like it? And we started having that, you know, having that dialogue with them, and um, you know, whether it be the setup and then it's hard on your hips and. Or, you know, I just don't understand kind of where, you know, where am I pushing from? And then I start thinking about it and go, you know, we, we got to look at this a little bit more in, in depth. So we actually did a whole year long study on it. And no, do I care to put it in a scientific journal? No, because I don't care about the Internet warriors. And I, I, I really don't. I mean, if, if, if you don't want to do them or if you do want to do them, keep doing them and let us play against you. And we'll beat you because you'll be on the sidelines probably hurt or you'll be using you'll be wasting a lot of time as well what my thoughts are. So, you know, what we've looked at and we've seen a lot of like SI joint issues. We've seen a lot of hip impingement potential problems. Now, I'm not one to believe that, you know, any sort of disc problems or issues, you know, are directly correlated to one thing. Cause I think there's a lot of things that happen, but, um, you know, I remember, you know, what was probably the biggest wake up call for me with the hip thrust was, you know, the fact that people in the industry, like you could see that they, they, they were doing it just to become popular because they wanted to jump on the bandwagon of other people. And, and they wanted to kind of get within that circle of our industry when they, when the best way to do it would be to actually start coaching and working. And I, I, I remember a time, Anthony, where 
shit didn't leave the gym about like an, a, a drill, like it didn't get, it didn't become popular until it didn't get out of the gym. Like garbage did not get out of the gym because we all did it within, with our groups and, and our athletes. Mm-hmm. So like if it didn't work, we just didn't do it. And it was like, oh, that was stupid. You know, because anybody that says that they didn't try standing on a BOSU ball and doing squats is either a liar, right? <laughs> yeah, right? Or, or maybe they just you, they don't, aren't doing it. But if you haven't done it and you're a coach, I think it's interesting because, like, it's really popular. Then, you know, you do it. You don't like it. You move on. And things didn't get out of the gym that were that bad. And um, the hip thrust has been around for a long time. It wasn't invented by anybody. I, I don't want to – to, to, to call things out. But the reality of it is, is there's not very many things that were invented. They were just utilized in different ways to, to, to work within your, your, your system. So I don't think the hip thrust is scalable, scalable across multiple groups. And I noticed that if 5% of our athletes have a problem with it, it shouldn't be in our program. Now, I understand that kids that have, you know, back issues and kids that have other problems aren't going to be doing a lot of things. So I don't want to use that as a blanket statement. But kids that are healthy and have a problem with it, we should look a little bit deeper into why. And it came to, you know, look at like, well, how does the spine work, right? And why are we, are we horizontally loading the spine? And if you're thinking about spine shear, why is it okay? Why is it not okay for us to, you know, deadlift? poorly, you know, and have bad posture when we deadlift because it's creating sheer force on the spine. And why is it not okay for us to do, go into real heavy extension in a hip flexor stretch to really try to work the psoas and like really drive our hips down because we're potentially creating hip impingement or issues like that. But yet it's not okay to put that same position, flip yourself on your back and then load your hips in that same position. I don't understand like what, how we didn't like use just logic to just filter this exercise out of our, our training. And when you maximally load that, I feel like it becomes very problematic for a lot of people, you know, and I don't think that it's just, it's not just the setup that makes it wrong. It's, it's the idea that it's not the best use of your time and that if there's a risk, we probably shouldn't be doing it. And a lot of people just didn't read the whole article. So there's two components to it. The number one is the science and the health of our spines and our backs. And number two is the idea that we just jump on people's bandwagons and we use that as our research instead of using ourselves, our athletes and our time in the gym. People just don't want to, they're lazy. So they're just like completely taking ownership of somebody else's system or idea and and in some way, that's a good thing, right? When someone has proven it and done well, like, you know, with Coach Boyle and a lot of other people that have had a lot of success, you listen to them. But you got to listen to them in context. You can't just take blanket statements and, and whether you look at the headline and go, oh, well, you know, I just disagree with him. Or you should like dive into it a little bit more deep and go, okay, maybe this doesn't work for me. That doesn't mean it's wrong. It just doesn't work for us. Or maybe that it's, it's probably not the best use of our time. Great point. So, I think a lot of people don't understand the po- purpose of the article and they just need to think and, and they want people to kind of think for them, which is just make it just, I don't understand it. I don't understand the idea that you don't have an opinion and that you don't want to like maybe have a, a, a stance on the opposite side and say, you know what? I disagree with that. And that's okay too. You, you absolutely should have that right. Um, I think when people just blindly agree and disagree with headlines, they, they've missed the point, you know, you know, that we're trying to make, as far as the industry and education. Absolutely. Good stuff. Good points. Um, our, you can uh, you can read that article, The Heavy Hip Thrust is Ruining Our Backs and in in, in This Industry at uh, on uh, Justin's uh, website. Um, let's switch gears. Let's finish up here, last five minutes, with uh, something very cool. I love Gary Vaynerchuk, and uh, a lot of my listeners do. You spent some time with him. You wrote a blog called The Three Biggest Takeaways from My Time with Gary V. What, uh, talk to us about this. Uh, so this was, it was a fun experience for me. Um, you know, it was, it was good. It, it's really interesting because I think that, you know, you say a lot of your listeners like Gary and, and look up to him. Um, I, I would say this. He's more impressive in person. 
And, and I think you'll understand this. And a lot of the people listening right now as coaches, you guys have all gone to seminars and you guys have gone to events and you, you, you have this guy's presence online or you've read his books or you've seen him interact, whether it be on video or, or someone's told you about anybody. Don't, don't think about Gary. Think about our industry and think about maybe something that you get super excited about. And then you meet them in person and you hear them speak and you're just wildly disappointed. And, um, and, and sometimes it's because, you know, hey, they're, you're not able to, to dive into details with them when they're talking or they're presenting the same stuff that they told you about in their product or in their book. And meeting Gary, he's actually more impressive in person. And I think that, that's hard to do, especially as outspoken as he is and as much as he's documented his process. So I think that that's the first thing I will tell you. It, it was really impressive just – understanding that he is very, very much all about like when he's there, that's why he has everybody else do his scheduling for him because when he's there, he's all in. And I think that's a really important thing as coaches that we should be able to take away is be a hundred percent present because this is a guy who has, you know, uh, multiple, you know, multiple, multiple million dollar companies and he's growing more of them and he's being pulled in 80 different directions. And yet when he's in a meeting, he's all in. And I think that as coaches, we kind of sometimes forget that. And I think that's one of the reasons why I would say right away, that's what made him very impressive uh, is that he didn't care about anything else that was going on at that moment, except for the people that were in that room. And I, and I really appreciated that because his mind wasn't somewhere else. Very cool. So that's the first thing. Um, and I wrote like literally in the blog, I was right, like, here's some of the same shit. And I was like, hustle, focus on your strengths. Don't sell what you don't do. 90% of the things in life don't matter. You know, um, say what you want, but back it up every time. And it's like, it all makes sense. And if you think about our world in sports or in fitness, it's like, yeah, look, if you want to be on the f- field and talk shit and, and that's fine, but if you can't back it up, right, then you're a shit talker. But if you could back it up, then you're just a confident dude. And it's interesting that the way that we look at it, right, if we look on TV and the guy that is, you know, you know, just acting a certain way and you're like, oh, well, that's just the way he is. And people idolize that. And then the, the same guy that sucks does it. And it's just like he's a prick and you have to know who you are. And that's kind of going back to the self-awareness that he talks about. And as athletes and coaches, we need to be self-aware of our strengths and weaknesses. So and we, I think it all starts there. So the three biggest takeaways was number one is like, you got to be true to who you were. So I'm, I'm definitely on the other side of the fence compared to him. He's very positive. So he'll get the exact same message across, but being ultra positive and being a very much an optimist. And I'm not like I, I'm, I play devil's advocate with everything that we do in the building. I look at our athletes and go, look, the reality of it is, is you just don't have the discipline that, you know, that it takes to play at the college level if you're a high school athlete. And here's the things that you're just not going to do. And I know that because you just haven't proved it. Prove me wrong. So I am very much on the negative side. He hates negativity. So I understand that, you know, we could be saying the same message but in a different way, and it'd still be okay, as long as you're true to who you are. But understand, don't, don't be a positive and big motivational rah-rah speaker if you're not that way. And don't be Mr. Negative and curse if that's not who you are either. And I think a lot of people started watching people, whether it be online or they're people that they like in the industry and want to model after, and they don't make it their own. And I think that's one of the hardest things is a young coach and a young professional is you start looking at everybody else And you forget who you are. So that was one of the first takeaways. The second thing is like walk in a room with a blank slate. Like the ability just to say, look, I have enough experience in my my life and in my education to be able to come in the room and and just hear what you have to say and then be able to give you information and not have to – I'm not saying preparation doesn't matter. But preparation from your time, whether it be coaching or reading in your history, in your past, is what got you that opportunity. And in my belief, the only difference between a good and a bad opportunity is the preparation for that moment. So if you walk in with a blank slate, it's almost like, hey, here's the situation. Let's go to work because I now have tools. It's almost like the athlete that is pissed off because he has shin splints, you know, when he starts two a days because he didn't train at all. Like, well, you weren't, that was, you know, that wasn't a bad tryout or a bad opportunity. You just weren't ready for it. And um, I think that's something that he teaches. There's a lot of parallels in our business. And the last one was just empathy. And this is the one where I cannot check the box. Like I, I do not, I don't sympathize with a lot of people and I, I know it sounds bad. It's just not my strength. I, I'm a big believer of like 
if you would have done it, if you say you're going to do it and you think you could have done it, you would have already done it. So don't complain or whine about it. And it's almost like all these people right now that are coming after me because I, I told them that I didn't like a certain drill and here's the reasons why. And you should think differently. They got their panties in a bunch. And it's like, look, get, you know, grow some thick skin, like seriously. And I, I have that. I have that mentality where I think kids need to be tougher. People need to man up. People need to be tougher. And he is very much like, yeah, you need to do that. But he's very empathetic to your situation. And I'm not. Like, I don't do really well with people that don't know what they want in life. Like, I'm more of a strategist than I am a motivational coach. And I am aware of that about myself. But learning those things from him, it makes me take another look because maybe that's why I'm failing. So instead of looking at them and saying, I want to be like that person, I think that you should look at somebody, whether it be like Gary or even somebody like yourself that's been putting on amazing educational experiences for 10 plus years and go, maybe I, I want to, I like what they're doing. How do I apply it to my own life? And then understand that context is king. Like what you do, it matters within context. You can't, you can't just tell somebody don't do something and that could affect their life because you just don't like that. And I think that it, it kind of comes back to the, whether it be the hip thrust article or anything else that I put out, it's like, look, I understand that people are trying to defend maybe their livelihood because you've built your entire life on one drill and, and you should defend it. But understand that, that I'm going to also defend my, you know, my reputation as a coach and, and put out information that I think is, is very good for our industry uh, and our athletes, because that's who I care about most. Um, and I think as coaches, you know, we're able to influence them. So we should just take a little bit hard look at ourselves and figure out kind of what we do well and what we don't. So, yeah, you know, yeah. that was, that's my business experience. Like it's not business, it's life. And yeah. I think if we start using those parallels, whether it be a books not related to sport and how we transfer it, and I think that's a big deal. Yeah, it's very cool. First of all, the awareness piece is is awesome. That you you know who you are. Um, but I love uh, that was what a great experience to to have that. But I think even better is that you you were able to kind of trans translate it or transfer it to our business. And you're so right that uh, that there are so many parallels, uh, so many parallels there. And you know you you're doing such great work out there. And I'm glad that you're starting to pick uh, pick up your social media presence because uh, we need more coaches like you. So. Uh, Coach, thanks so much for coming on today. I really appreciate all of your insights, not only into just the speed training and 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 strength and and you know the the uh, the hip thrust article and really about some of these different ideas from other industries, but uh, uh, great stuff that you're putting out there. So we really appreciate you coming on. Absolutely, and thanks for having me. And you know what? Thank you to all the coaches out there. I mean, there's a lot of people that listen to this, and and I'm just going to talk to you guys for a second. You guys are the difference makers. You know, I know like we, we have athletes that we're going to market because they've had a lot of success and it's really cool to have like the Keenan Reynolds of the world. who's like one of the best players in college football and have a chance to work with them. But it's, it's coaches like you that get that, that, that are like the biggest people in our industry. Cause you guys get to infiltrate the lowest level and it will, that will start to increase the, the barrier of entry in our industry and just have the expectation higher. People are not going to be able to get away with just saying that, Hey, you know, let's just go do anything, you know? And uh, they're going to start saying, no, I have more awareness, both of myself, but in of fitness and of performance. And I think that that's a really good thing. And it all comes down to the coaches and, and people like you that put out amazing content constantly. Very cool. Thanks again, coach. Absolutely. Thank you. All right, well, that's going to do it for episode 196 of the Strength Coach Podcast. Special thanks to Chris Pryor, Aaron McGurr, and the folks over at Perform Better. You can check them out at performbetter.com for all their products and info on their educational seminars. Thanks to Coach Boyle and Coach Cavanaugh for sharing their insights and philosophies into the world of strength and conditioning, nutrition, performance enhancement, and speed. Thanks to Alan Cosgrove for the Results Fitness University Business of Fitness segment. Check them out at resultsfitnessuniversity.com. Of course, remember you can join strengthcoach.com and have access to the site for just $1, three days, just a buck. Once your three-day trial is over and you become a member, you'll be able to download Coach Boyle's two books, Designing Strength Training Programs and Facilities, as well as Advances in Functional Training. And remember, if you have a staff of two or more and you want to sign up as a group, we have a special membership offer for you, up to 50% off. To access that offer, go to strengthcoach.com, click the Join Now button to get started on your trial. My name is Anthony Miranda. You can reach me at strengthcoachpodcast at gmail.com. Thanks again, and I'll speak to you next time.